I want to talk to you about Parkinson's. I don't know if anyone's talked about Parkinson's disease yet this weekend. Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative disease. It affects the central nervous system. It's named after James Parkinson, who uh, was a British physician. And um, this is a disease that uh, results in certain hallmark symptoms. You see a, um, a deterioration of memory and thought process. You see uh, loss of facial expression, um, tremor of the hand, an uncoordinated gait. And there's a rigidity that settles in on the musculature over time. And uh, this is a really cruel disease, disease to witness. My, my father was diagnosed just over a year ago. And uh, he was somebody who was just had incredible mind and spoke French and Chinese and had a international business with thousands of customers and traveled all over the world and played in the stock market and would love to do prodigious math problems in his head while other people were struggling to figure it out on calculators. And today he can't make change for a dollar. He can't read the time on a clock face. And sometimes he makes sense. Sometimes he's very lucid and other times his words are just, just a jumble, a melange of nonsense. If you look online and you go to doctors and you talk to them, you go to experts, you want to say, what, what's going on with Parkinson's? What, what puts us at risk for Parkinson's? They'll say, well, it's got to be genes. You know, it's got to be genetics. Uh, somehow we're predisposed, but we don't know what causes it. And we don't know what causes it. But there's some interesting information out there, uh, some interesting theories. And milk comes to play it here again uh, with Parkinson's disease risk. There have been a number of studies that have shown that as milk drinking goes up, uh, Parkinson's disease risk goes up. People who drink the most milk compared to those who drink the least or none at all uh, may have about a doubling of their risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And this is one that kind of threw researchers, you know, they thought, well, wait a second, what in the milk could be contributing to the risk of Parkinson's disease? And at the top of their list of suspects was the, the, the neurodegenerative pesticides that accumulate in milk and dairy products. And it's an interesting theory because people who work with pesticides professionally, who, who exterminators, who apply them, they have about a 70% elevated risk for developing Parkinson's disease. And people who work in intensive agriculture where they spray copious amounts of these chemicals, they have about a 70% elevated risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And people who live in close proximity to intensive uh, spraying in agriculture have an elevated risk for Parkinson's because they get exposed to the drift through the windows and doors and such in their community. And we know that in laboratory experiments where we sacrifice animals and we dose them with these chemicals, they develop symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And when we do autopsy on the brain tissue of people who have died from Parkinson's disease, we find a higher concentration of these neurodegenerative chemicals. So it shouldn't be a surprise because... If, obviously we haven't established causation here, and certainly genes play a role, but it really shouldn't be a surprise because pesticides, of which there are 16,000 different formulas approved for use in this country, are designed to destroy the nervous system of living things. That's how they work. They create a paralysis, rapid onset, but that's what the design of these chemicals is. So the FDA has been doing for years these periodic surveys. They call it the, the market basket survey, where they go get food randomly from markets all over the country, and then they test them for contaminants just to find out what we're being exposed to. And in their last survey, all 740 milk samples had pesticide residues in them. Now I want to move on to uh, another condition uh, I want to, you know, I want to just talk to you very quickly about heart disease. I'm not going to go into any depth. Uh, we could talk about that for hours. Heart disease, you may or may not have heard this as well. It's the number one killer in this country. It takes more lives than all forms of cancer combined. Every 34 seconds, another American has a heart attack. And in about 40% of cases, that's the first symptom. They don't know that they have heart disease because it can advance for decades without any symptom, without anyone really knowing that they've got it. 
And like many chronic degenerative diseases, it's a multifactorial disease. There are many factors that come together to set the stage and put you at risk. But if you look at it from a dietary, dietary standpoint, you'll hear a lot from conservative public health organizations about dietary saturated fat. And a lot will refer to it as the artery clogging dietary saturated fat and how that increases risk. Well, milk and dairy products are the number one source of saturated fat in the American diet. And there's a lot of interesting research uh, related to that, looking at heart disease and milk consumption and such that you can look at, uh, look online very easily. Uh, I want to talk to you about Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is an inflammatory bowel disease, and it's... Uh, it's actually an autoimmune disease where the body turns on itself and starts attacking its own tissues. And Crohn's waxes and wanes. It has relapse, remission. Relapse, remission is how it progresses. The symptoms are uh, inflamed gut with lesions, bloody diarrhea regularly, uh, electrolyte imbalance, vitamin mineral deficiency, dehydration. And the Treatment is typically anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, immune-suppressive drugs, both of which have issues too, uh, potentially serious side effects. But there's no cure and there's no known cause. You may have read about people curing Crohn's disease uh, anecdotally, but for the most part, it's accepted that there is no known cure. And... Uh, there's an interesting gentleman I interviewed in, in London, England. His name's John Herman Taylor, and uh, he's at King's College. I interviewed him for my, for my film, and uh, he's been following this thread for a while. He's very, very interested in human Crohn's. And uh, one day he became aware that there's this disease in dairy cattle that looks very strikingly similar to Crohn's disease in humans. And in fact... By all measures, it is basically Crohn's disease in dairy cattle. They call it Yanni's disease. The cows have the, the inflammation, the lesions. They have the bloody diarrhea. They are, are deficient in vitamins and minerals that they're not absorbing. They're dehydrated. And, of course, they're unproductive. A sick cow is not a productive cow, so they're not making money. And this is a real plague for the dairy industry. But the thing about... Yanni's diseases, they know what causes it. It's caused by something called Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis. It's a mouthful, or MAP. And this MAP is the cause of Yanni. So John Herman Taylor said, you know, could we be getting exposed to MAP, and could that be the cause of Crohn's disease in humans? And there weren't a lot of people to talk to about this because there hasn't been a lot of interest in this. So he started looking into MAP, and he put together some, got some funding, and he put together a team of researchers, and he said, let's go start talking to people who have Crohn's. And they found some Crohn's sufferers, and they said, we want to follow this thread. Can we take some tissue samples from you and examine them? And they did. And in 90% of the Crohn's sufferers, they found MAP. Now, John Herman Taylor will make, you know, very bold statements about this. Uh, he's, he's, had his, he's had his head in this for a long time. I think about a decade, maybe a little bit more, and he's published a number of times about this. But he told me on camera, he said, I believe that 90% of all the human Crohn's that we see today is caused by exposure to MAP. And I said, well, what about, what about uh, pasteurization? And he said, pasteurization doesn't kill MAP. I said, how do you know? He said, because. Let me give you the studies. We've pulled and grown live map right out of milk pulled off store shelves in North America and in Europe. Small percent, about 1% to 3% will grow that. Well, it's a bit of a lottery. I mean, who knows if they're getting that milk? So I looked up uh, the USDA's surveys because they do these herd surveys on disease incidents and such, and I wanted to find out how much MAP was present in the U.S. dairy herds. And the USDA's last survey says 68% of the herds have MAP. So it's an interesting, provocative thing to, to give some consideration to, but 
Suffice it to say, putting map on your cornflakes in the morning may not be the best idea. Now I want to talk to you about contaminants. I want to talk to you about dioxin. Dioxin, you've probably heard about. Dioxin kind of came to the forefront after the Vietnam War because many uh, uh, men and women who participated in that war came back with a whole host of symptoms, and very diverse. And they had these illnesses that no one could really attribute to anything, and, and the people who were providing health care were really kind of confused and, and, and didn't know what to make of it. And some started pushing and prodding and demanding more information. Over time, it came out that these soldiers were exposed to something called Agent Orange. Agent Orange is a, an herbicide, a defoliant, and we wanted to defoliate the jungle so that our enemy couldn't hide from us. So you've got that issue alone, which is not great to be doused in or exposed to uh, an herbicide. But in time, it came out that the defoliant was contaminated with dioxin. And that's kind of when people started to really pay attention to dioxin to see if there may be some relationship between that dioxin and some of these symptoms, some of these conditions that were being observed. And dioxin is kind of the name for a whole class of dioxin and dioxin-like compounds, about 75 different ones that are members of this group. And the one that we're most interested in, that the most research has been conducted around, is called uh, 2378 tetrachlorodibenzopedioxin, or TCDD. And that chemical we know is a human carcinogen. We also know that it's associated with uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, thyroid disease, uh, immune dysfunction, uh, higher uh, incidence of allergies, complex allergies, and developmental disorders and birth defects. And interestingly, you know, when, they, when these uh, soldiers uh, started having kids, we started seeing, you know, illnesses in the next generation, too, which has been followed as well. There's a gentleman, I think Arnold Schechter, I'm sure, in Dallas, who's, who's stayed with this for decades, very, very interested in it. So dioxin, if you want to minimize your exposure to it, you want to look at diet, because 90% of all the dioxin you will ever be exposed to comes from your diet, okay? So if you put it on a hierarchy, where do you think the most dioxin is? Red meat. Red meat's the number one source of dioxin. And then position two and three are dairy products, different dairy foods and milk. That's where it concentrates. Because it's lipophilic, it binds with fat, it concentrates in the flesh of the animals, it bioaccumulates over time, and then when you slaughter the animal and cut it up, you take on its, you inherit that, that payload of bioconcentrated toxins. And if, when a dairy cow uh, makes milk, she mobilizes her fat stores, and that's where all the chemicals are stored. So all those sequestered chemicals then get released in the milk, you drink the milk, you take it on. It's a hand-me-down poison. So dioxin is also, this form is also known to be an endocrine disruptor. It's a persistent synthetic hormone. So back to that original question of being exposed to hormones and hormone economy in the body. It's something you may want to pay attention to. Uh, another thing I want to talk to you about is perchlorate. And perchlorate, and this is bizarre, it's rocket fuel. It's the explosive ingredient in solid booster rocket fuel. So it's used in rockets and missiles. It's actually used in, in uh, safety restraint airbags in cars, and fireworks as well. And it started showing up some years ago in water, and we didn't know a lot about it, but we do know that it's coming from uh, military installations that have allowed it to leak into different uh, waterways. Uh, it's been working its way into the Colorado River for quite a long time, which is diverted for irrigation purposes. And it's taken up by the root systems of the plants. It's integrated into the plant, and you feed the plant to an animal, and once again, that process begins where we take on, we inherit the payload of toxins from them. And it's been found in 217 of 232 milk samples. And again, we don't know a lot about perchlorate. There's some people that suspect it may be a human carcinogen. But I do know one thing. It interferes with the uptake of iodine, so it disrupts the production of thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone is something that's pretty important when you're talking about uh, say, the development of a fetus. So if you have 
a, a mother who's pregnant and she's at a critical gestation window, say day 20, when the neural tubes are closing, and she gets an exposure that causes a fluctuation in thyroid hormone, there could be critical changes that occur in the nervous system of her offspring, irreversible, that will manifest later as attention deficit, IQ deficiency, um, learning disabilities, challenges like that. And no one will really ever know where to make the association. You know, where did that come from? Who knows? So it's, it's interesting to think about. If you, the, the EPA, they set a, uh, uh, a safe dose, kind of allowable level, like we do for all of these contaminants that we keep introducing in the environment. And if you, if you follow that dubious recommendation, just from drinking milk, our, uh, about 50% of kids, one to five, will exceed that dubious level. About 35% of children from uh, six to 11 will be exposed. About 7% of women of childbearing age will exceed that exposure level. And the reason I say that is a dubious thing is, you know, None of us are exposed to one of these things at a time. You're not just exposed to perchlorate. You're exposed to carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, neurotoxic chemicals, mercury, dioxin, perchlorate. It's, what's the synergy? What's the concerted effect? How do these things compound the effect of one another? We just don't have that research. We just can't tell anybody. So once again, if you're being exposed to something that you don't need... It's not benefiting you. You have that opportunity to minimize your exposure. You have an opportunity to get that out of your diet and reduce your exposure to this, in this case, perchlorate. 